What's up, duelists? Much like cooking, mixing audio, or creating a beautiful sculpture, deck building is both a science and an art. It's as much a form of self-expression as writing a song or making a short film, but it can also deliver results in that similarly cruel way as in balancing the ingredients to a cake. I build new decks almost every single day on this channel, and while some of these decks are <laughs> far from perfect, I've seen enough tournament success with decks that I've built in the past 17 or so years to feel confident enough sharing some of my thoughts on the subject. So confident, in fact, that by the end of this video, you'll likely view the entire processing of deck building at least a little bit differently. While this channel is primarily a Yu-Gi-Oh channel, all of these skills talked about in this video apply to almost every single competitive PvP card game, and even some PvP strategy games that don't even involve cards. So, if you learned something from this video, or you just enjoyed the conceptual discussion in any way, leave a like, uh, consider subscribing, it really helps me out. Maybe share the video with a friend, too. That's a, that's a big help as well. My name is Keegan, and these are the nine most critical skills necessary to building successful competitive decks in your favorite game. Critical skill number one, understanding Bloom's taxonomy. <laughs> I bet you guys <laughs> are like, yo, <laughs> I didn't sign up for a science lesson. I'm just trying to improve my deck. But no, no, hear me out. Hear me out. Basically, this dude named Benjamin Bloom. No, not that guy. This guy got together with a bunch of other really smart educators, teachers, masters of their own subjects, and put together a hierarchy-based system that classifies mastery or learning different things into a kind of a fun little video game level up chart. There's a couple different quote-unquote Bloom's taxonomy pyramids. One's for cognitive-based stuff, the other's for more emotional-based stuff. Both of these are super important when doing anything at a high level. But they apply a fair bit into the next few things I'm going to be talking about in this video, so it's important that you guys understand this stuff. More or less, to inevitably get to the final stages of knowledge and mastery, you have to have like a pretty solid understanding and base level understanding of what it is you're studying. And that brings me to critical skill number two, base knowledge. Understand the fundamental concepts of competitive card games. I think there are three fundamental concepts that are super important, and there are a few other ones that, you know, come in here or there. The big three, and I think these are the big three concepts of any competitive card game having played several myself. The first one, card advantage. This is the raw number of cards you have to work with over your opponent, vice versa. If they have card advantage, they have more cards than you to work with. If you have more cards to work with, you have more options. It's just the way it works. It's always a good thing. Well, not always, but for the most part, you want to understand the basic concept of card advantage and why it's usually a good thing. The next of these three things is the tempo or rhythm of the game you're playing. This is more game specific, but most competitive PvP games or card games are turn based. They have certain once per turn actions. It's super important to understand these once per turn actions, as well as understand which one of them is best to break using your card effects. For example, in Pokemon, you can only attach one energy per turn. There are several cards in the game throughout the game's history that allow you to do more than that once per turn. They allow you to break the rules of the game, therefore achieve extra rhythm, extra time on your opponent. Super important concept to understand. In Yu-Gi-Oh, there's normal summons, in Magic, there's lands, etc, etc. There's lots of different once per turn based actions across a ton of different games. And then the last thing is card activity. This is similar to card advantage, but it's more pseudo card advantage. Can you play the cards in your hand? Are you overloading on cards into your deck that you basically can't play literally at all? In Pokemon, there are evolution Pokemon. In Yu-Gi-Oh, there are tribute monsters. In Magic the Gathering, there are high mana cost cards. These are all examples of cards that you physically cannot cast without cheating, unless you've met these very specific requirements. Having high card activity means you have more options, similar to having more card advantage, of course, but it's a little bit more abstract than a literal number. This is an important concept to understand with regards to the basics of deck building. Other base level knowledge that you need to have is you obviously need to understand the rules of the game you're playing. You need to understand the card pool that you're working with. I think having a deep memorization, deep knowledge of all of the legal cards that you're working with is a very, very good thing to have. And if you get the chance to just 
go through like a card bank on Google, Wikipedia, whatever, Dueling Book, PTCGO, Arena, whatever platform it is you're playing on. Just reading through cards, familiarizing yourself with your options is never a bad thing. The more you know in this area, the more options you're gonna have in later areas. So work on this at every chance you get. Critical skill number three, creating a concept map for your deck. This is a super important skill and I usually do this for almost every single deck I make. And I know it sounds tiring, but it helps so much and actually saves you so much time later on if you have a very clear cut concept map for your deck. Write out your deck's purpose. So for me, sometimes I'll be building a deck to go to a local tournament, or I'll be building a deck to play some matches for a YouTube video, or I'll be building a deck to go to a major tournament. These are three of the many, many things I've built decks for, but probably the most used three for me. Once I have my deck's purpose defined, I also write out exactly how much time I have from start to finish in order to figure out a time management schedule for practicing and refining my deck. This comes up with later skills, but it's important to have early on in the deck building process. The next thing I write is what's the deck's expected function both inside and outside of the game. If I'm taking the deck to a big tournament, do I expect to win with this deck? Do I expect to just have a good time with this deck? If I'm making it for a YouTube video, am I just trying to show off a certain combination of cards or am I trying to focus on a concept I'm trying to highlight or am I trying to actually showcase something fully competitive? Am I trying to win this large tournament? Am I trying to win my locals rather than just dick around with my friends, have fun with some fun cards? What is the actual purpose outside of the game as well as inside of the game? Is my deck trying to control things by playing a long game towards late game bombs or is it trying to aggro rush down my opponent or am I trying to play somewhere in between? Basically, what is the role of my deck inside the game and how do I plan to achieve both of these goals? All of this stuff gets written on the concept map. All of it. You got to write it down. Once you have it all written down, it expedites all of the further process and building your deck. This is a super underrated skill that I think a lot of people don't fully utilize, but it helps so much in just gathering your thoughts and keeping them cohesive and keeping yourself on track for executing the best and most optimized deck list possible, spending as little time as possible doing so. There's a bunch of other stuff you can write on the concept map, but these are the basic ones. Number four, now that you know where you're taking your deck to, now that you know the deck's purpose, now that you know everything that your deck is trying to do, you want to learn the projected metagame of that specific environment. This can be a bit tricky to do if the environment doesn't offer a lot of data. For example, if I'm entering a local in a new city I've never been to before, I might not know that the majority of the people at that tournament are going to be playing a specific deck that's popular in that region. Generally speaking, for local tournaments or unknown tournaments, I like to go in preparing for as much stuff as possible using as broad answers as possible. But if you know the specific metagame, let's say it's a one deck format or you're going to a YCS where you have a lot of accurate data, you can focus on specific weaknesses and weak points or blind spots that this metagame data is kind of ignoring and attack those proverbial vulnerabilities. Critical skill number four, you must test your deck. Theory crafting can only get you to a certain point. Actually playing with the deck, actually understanding if all of your theories, all of your ideas are gonna work is super important. Of course, as you get better at the game, you can understand things a little bit more, you can expedite this process, but if you're newer to your game, you're gonna have to play a certain number of hours to fully understand exactly how your deck is gonna work. I would say allocate a good amount of time to this in your time management portion of your concept map. In the testing portion, it's good to push boundaries. It's good to focus on trying out as many ideas as you have time for. It's also good to focus on those weaknesses if you have that data from the metagame portion. In testing, I think it's important to have a balance of testing with trusted partners, people who you think are very good at the game, and also testing against wider fields, like perhaps an online ladder. You want to have a nice balance of both of these because they train particularly different skills, both of which you'll need in a tournament setting. If you test too much within a small play group, even if they are good players, you'll be subconsciously focusing more on exploiting the habits of your play group and not necessarily recognize your own weaknesses in a more diverse field. However, playing against ladder, you may get a lot of random opponents playing jank and not really have the full understanding of playing against an opponent that you trust knows how to play the game well. 
The way I sort of see this is that playing against ladder opponents helps you in early rounds of tournament, and playing against trusted opponents helps you in later rounds of opponents where you've maybe won the first few rounds of the tournament. Both of these are super important, definitely do both if you get the chance. With regards to Bloom's Taxonomy, this is rank number three, application. It's where you're finally starting to apply the knowledge, apply the concepts you've learned in the first few steps, and start to build foundational technique necessary to move on to the later stages. This is also a portion where your emotional bias starts to get the better of you. This is something to be aware of when testing. It can be frustrating losing games over and over again. Remember, the cards don't care about your feelings, so you need to be more receiving to change, more responsive to that sort of thing. Otherwise, you'll never be able to move past certain points and learn the stuff necessary in order to get better at the game, become a master, become... You know, you know what I'm saying. You get what I'm saying. Bloom's Taxonomy. Refer back to it. It's important. It matters. Next skill. Optimization. Again, back to Bloom's Taxonomy. This is the next level. This is level 4, Analysis. Much like earlier where you focused on the weaknesses of the metagame, which also was analysis. Of course, Bloom's Taxonomy is much more fluid than this exact stepwise function than, you know, it is perceived. But you, you're doing every part of it at every stage, just in micro, macro levels. Just try to understand the concepts, alright? That's, that's basically the whole point I'm trying to get here. Anyway, optimization. Optimization. Much like earlier, you focused on the weaknesses of the specific metagame. Now that you've tested your deck, you've tested your answers to those weaknesses, analyze your gameplay. Look back on replays of yourself playing, film yourself playing if you have a chance, look at what it is you did, focus on the weaknesses of your own strategy. Did drawing that card in that specific moment help you out or did it hurt you? Were certain cards inconsistent for you? Were certain cards good for you? Did certain cards increase your win percentage or decrease your win percentage? Did certain cards increase your activity or decrease your activity? Did they lead to more card advantage or more tempo gains? This is the point where you reflect upon your gameplay, reflect upon your testing, and begin to work out more of the details with regard to your deck. If your deck isn't working at all, if it is completely incoherent, if it has conflicting strategies that are causing it to fall apart within itself, maybe it's time to go back to step number two. Redefine a new deck's purpose. Write a new concept map. Go back to the drawing board. It's totally fine to do that if your deck just isn't cutting it. If you're doubtful in a deck's strategy, it might be better to leave more time for resetting this schedule altogether, going back to the drawing board, going through the testing, than allocating a large amount of time to testing. This is sort of the rinse and repeat cycle that comes with putting in your 10,000 hours, right? There's this theory developed by a guy named Malcolm Gladwell in his book, Outliers, The Story of Success, that if you put 10,000 hours into something, at a high level, just practicing the full range of Bloom's taxonomy, you will become a master at the subject. While I don't necessarily agree with this, because practice can sometimes harm you through the development of bad habits, repeating steps two through five in these critical skills thing over and over again until you have a basic idea of how this should go can only help you. The more you do this, the easier it gets is basically what I'm trying to say. Critical skill number six. This one is big. Play other games. Look at other successful deck builders, not just in the game you're practicing, but in other games in general. My biggest influences for this channel and for building decks oftentimes don't even come from Yu-Gi-Oh at all. Most of my favorite deck builders actually play Magic the Gathering and Pokemon. I've definitely built decks on this channel, Yu-Gi-Oh decks, that have direct inspiration from stuff like Paolo Vito Demo de Rosa's Delver deck from 2012, or John Finkel's Season Pass Pro Tour deck, or Ross Cawthon's The Truth Vile Plume Lock deck, or even obscure stuff like John Robert II's Kling Kling Nationals Top 8 deck from 2012 or some crazy shit like that. Looking at other people building decks within your own card game limits your perspective. Playing other games, it gives you a broader understanding of the fundamental concepts of competitive card games in general, it increases your knowledge, it increases your perspective, it broadens your, your depth of stuff you can pull from when being creative, when attacking weaknesses in metagames, when doing all of the stuff on this list. It's something I can't recommend enough. Certain concepts like card activity, stuff that I've worked into my videos, into my gameplay, I would have never even come up with this kind of stuff or figured out this kind of stuff 
if I hadn't been playing chess or playing other PvP strategy games like Super Smash Bros. Melee. All of these games, all of these different interactions we have with other people, with other systems, it helps us approach these things with new eyes, with a more clear perspective. And that brings me to critical skill number seven, constantly refresh your objectivity. With any creative field, it's very easy to overbake things, so to speak. You can work on a deck so much that you lose sight of your original concept. This is another reason why the concept map is so important and why it's so important to refer back to it. But even with the concept map, it's sometimes difficult to break our own habits, to get out of our own comfort zone in order to make the best choice for our deck. Approaching subjects objectively, letting go of some of your emotional attachment to certain cards, your emotional attachment to certain moments in time where something was good, something was bad, whatever, in order to make the best possible decision for your deck is sometimes very necessary. In the previous skill, playing other games is a pretty surefire way to refresh your objectivity, but maybe you don't wanna play other games. Another way to refresh objectivity is just play a different deck for a little while. Take a break, step away from it, go do something for fun, go, go shoot some hoops, play some ball, you know? Hang out with the boys, go out to the bar, I don't know, do something fun. Refresh your objectivity, it, it, there's a million ways to do this. You can Google ways to do this, but it is an important thing you need to do in every creative field and deck building is no exception. Critical skill number eight, back to Bloom's taxonomy. This one relates more to the emotional hierarchy. Have fun. If you value something, if it brings emotional joy to you, you're gonna be more likely and have an easier time at doing the higher level stuff with regards to that action. It's scientifically proven. If you're having a good time, you're gonna do better in general, in life, in whatever it is you're approaching video games, relationships, friendships, family stuff, careers. If you're having fun, it's infectious. It's great. It improves every part of what you're doing. And as a result, it does improve your decks. It's, it's scientific. It's science. It's science. I'm a scientist right now. Mandark in his fucking lab right now. The villain, Dexter's laboratory, Jendi Tarkovsky. I think this is honestly one of the most important things. It's the reason you're even doing steps one through eight is because you find this fun. If you find at any point you're not having fun, quit. There's nothing wrong with that either. Just don't build decks. It's not for everyone. It's a lot of work and it can be very unrewarding to build your own deck and lose over and over and over again in testing, trying to find that competitive edge against these already best decks in a certain metagame. There is absolutely no shame in net decking. There's no shame in taking a deck that someone else built and playing it and having a good time yourself. You don't need to build decks to play a game and have a good time. If you're not having fun doing it, don't do it. Anyway, these are the nine most critical skills for building decks. If you guys liked the video, make sure and leave a like, leave a comment. Super helps out the channel. Shoutouts to Outback Yu-Gi-Oh for the idea for this video. I'll leave a link to his channel in the description below. Also, follow me on Twitter. I am now on Twitter, at e 3 yu gi -Oh. I tweet fun stuff. I talk about fun stuff. I engage with people. It's a good time. Follow me there. Smash like, subscribe. E3 Yu-Gi-Oh! Signing off. Peace.